Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Stuff That Chris Thinks. Um, we were talking recently, it may have been the last video, a little bit about the Congregational Retreat and it got me to thinking there was a time in the Congregational Retreat this past year, I think it was after lunch, we were in a study with Peter and the discussion of the study had turned to, does God speak to his people? and how do his people hear and respond. And for me, it was a very invigorating study to hear some of your stories of God speaking to you. And I thought we would take today to talk about that a little bit more in depth. Perhaps this is an encouragement to you as you walk in your Christian life, walking with your God and with your Creator. Does God speak to his people? Absolutely. I'm thinking in particular, there's a, there's a part in the scriptures, John 10, and Jesus says, My sheep will know me, and my sheep will hear my voice, and my sheep will follow my voice. So if you are God's sheep, if you are God's Christian, God's member of his, of his flock, you've heard and you've responded, and the evidence is in fact your Christian life. I want to tell you a little story of one time I heard God speaking to me, and then we'll look at what are the elements of discernment in hearing God's voice, and then we'll catch Peter for a little conversation. So here's a little story. I remember being a teenager. I worked for a lot of summers at a place called Ontario Pioneer Camp, and I remember those summers were really good for me. I imagined in those summers that eventually in my life I would end up working with youth in a professional capacity and in a ministry setting. And I remember thinking as a younger person, no need to rush this when God is ready, you know, he will send the signal and then off we'll go. So I, I had imagined youth ministry eventually, but I started to prepare. I went to a, a Bible college and then eventually I went off to seminary. And I think it maybe was my second year of seminary or, or somewhere around there. I was at church one Sunday and uh, I was playing the drums, just kind of minding my own business type of thing. And after the service that day, there was a woman in the congregation and she came up to me and she had written a little uh, kind of note down on a piece of paper. And she more or less said to me, Chris, you know, maybe pray and think about this because I think maybe God is calling you into ministry at this point in your life. And I thought it was interesting that she wrote all this stuff down on a piece of paper and, and her instructions were think and pray. This is not a thus say the Lord minute, but this could be a moment where God's leading uh, and I should maybe be listening. So I thought and prayed and I may have that note still somewhere in my desk. It's a bit of a mess at home. I couldn't tell you. But I remember maybe a week or a week after I was at a seminary and I went to the job posting boards thinking, well, Lord, if you are leading in this, you know, this is probably where I would follow you. And there was a posting for a church, maybe 20 minutes, 15 minutes walking distance from our house. Uh, Nissa and I didn't have a car at that time. So that seemed to fit the bill and I applied there. And then I worked there. I ended up working there for four years. Um, so that's one small instance of where I've heard God's voice and God's call in my life. I believe that God speaks to you folks as well. And if you're looking for a few kind of discernment points of how to hear and how to respond, I will catch you over at the whiteboard and we'll look at that together. So I drew a little diagram here, folks, and uh, we're going to use my little story of hearing God to pull out some of the parts that we may want to have part, a part of our discernment process when we are listening and following Jesus. So in my little story, I said first that I love to drum it's really engaging hitting stuff with sticks. So we've got here a drum stool. And if you're going to sit on a stool, you want it to be sturdy and you want to have confidence in that stool. So we're going to use the stool as a little metaphor to describe how we can have confidence in God's call as we discern his leading and his voice. So in my little story, uh, I first thought that maybe God would use me in youth ministry working at Pioneer Camp. It was just kind of a sense in my spirit or in my soul that God was leading in this direction. And in fact, Jesus says, John 16, 13, 
that the Spirit will lead us into all truth. And in fact, the New Testament says that the Spirit is a Spirit of truth, and you can pick up those themes at various other points in New Testament scriptures. So the Spirit leads us and prods us to know the heart of God. But it doesn't stop just there. In my case, uh, there was a woman after church one Sunday who came and said, Chris, maybe now is the time. Think about if God is calling you. And this is an important part of us hearing and discerning God's voice as well. God gives gifts to the body of Christ. And in fact, we need the whole body together. One of the gifts that God gives the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, is the gift of discernment. So if I think, this is a wild example, if I think maybe God is calling me to move to Angola or somewhere, I may, you know, think it's a great idea, but maybe someone in the body of Christ would come to me and say, Chris, just calm for a second and let's think and let's discern. So the body of Christ is important for us to hear and discern God's leading. Of course, Scripture. Scripture is foundation to our Christian life. Scripture is a record of who Jesus is, of what he's done, and we know, of course, that Jesus is the revelation of God's grace and God's love. Jesus reveals the Father to us. If we have, if I'm going to move to Angola and I feel it good in my heart, and someone in the body of Christ maybe hasn't helped me to discern well, Scripture can still tell us, you know, Chris, maybe think about where God has placed you, and whether or not you can just roam the world freely. Um, More on that later, though. I don't want to undervalue the presence of Scripture in our life. And then finally, if I've had three sturdy legs, but no seat on my drum stool, let's not get into this, but it would not be a pleasant thing to sit on. So the seat is crucial and important as well. In John 15, Jesus talks about the importance of abiding in him. And to abide means to live with and to spend time with. When this, uh, the woman after the church came to me and said, Chris, maybe think about going into youth ministry. I think it was maybe a month or two months or three months that I, I let that idea sit with me that I mauled over this little note that she gave to me before I went to the job posting board in the seminary. And then it was maybe a month or two after that, um, we did an interview and then there was a little discernment process after that before I started into anything. So there is, there is time in our Christian life to be in prayer, to walk with Jesus, to not necessarily rush into anything. In my experience of walking with the Lord, I have not known him to be in a rush for basically anything. What is good will happen in God's time. And as you follow his leading, his plans will unfold in his time as well. With all these components together though, with the spirits prodding, with the discernment of the body, with the teaching of scripture, and with spending time with Jesus, I want to suggest to you humbly that God in fact can speak and God can lead and you can follow the movements of his spirit. Hey everyone, we'll talk for a second about how we hear from God, place of scripture, and maybe Is there a risk involved in following him? So, is there a time you've heard from God in your life? Yeah, I think think God speaks in two kinds of ways to me. Um, One is the nudge. um, The sense of God pushing the Holy Spirit, nudging, conscience moving. Any of those words might fit. Um, And those seem to me to be more episodic, but I mean in the moment. Um, I see a situation and God nudges and says you should do something about that. Um, So the homeless person who obviously needs some help, maybe an obvious one of those, but in other situations too. Um, I've had the moments where I've had this sense, you know, you really should call so-and-so. And And I picked up the phone and called them and they said, how do you know to call? Which so I think that there's that episodic, the nudge. I also do think that Scripture, and we're going to get there in a moment. Oh, we'll get there now. Uh, scripture forms us, shapes us, helps us, gives us a worldview. Mm. And out of that worldview, I think that then impacts the way we live. So, for example, um, you know, it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Mm-hmm. Or it's, 
Yeah, you might get angry, but don't let it fester overnight. So that means if I blow my cool, the scripture says I better call that person today mm. and say I'm sorry. Mm. And you know what? It's a lot easier to do that today than tomorrow or the day after that or the day after that. Mm. So it's not just, I think, good biblical stuff. I think it's also good human nature stuff. Yeah. So I think that the, the broad principles of how to live are present in Scripture and help shape us. Mm -hmm. Now, I realize that one of the questions people also want to know is, so how do you make the big decisions? Yeah. How do you make those grand decisions? Well, I have two parts of that. One is, if we're living the little decisions, then I think the, easy, the bigger ones are falling in place more easily. Mm -hmm. If we've learned to be listening, hearing the nudge in the little things, it's probably easier to hear the nudge in the big ones. But for me, and this is just for me, I know, I know not everyone's built the way I am, my stomach really matters. Oh, I was not <laughs> expecting you to say that. Tell me more. <laughs> so if I've made a really big decision, I have learned that one, I need to take till the next day to announce the decision. Mm -hmm. So, for example, coming here, let me use moving to Fergus as the example. Debbie and I have learned that we may preach for the call, we may have everything go real well, it's gone brilliantly well, but we've learned that we cannot make the decision in the moment. Hmm. We need 24 hours, we need to sleep on what we're thinking and make the decision the next day, firm the decision the next day. Hmm. And for me that measure is, did I have a good night's sleep hmm. and was my stomach not churning? Hmm. If my stomach was churning and I didn't have a good night's sleep, that for me, given my age, I've learned <laughs> over years, yeah. is a sign of eh, probably not the right one. Mm. But if I had a good night's sleep or my stomach's not churning, that's for me. Now, I realize that's not for everybody. Mm. But I think that as we mature, we start to know those signs in us, how the Spirit guides and leads. Mm. I'm thinking just off the top of my head that both of our little stories were about professional ministry. I don't know how many of our congregation are going into professional ministry soon. Are, are there stories we could come up with that are like, not more mundane, but kind of general lived experience? I don't mean to put either of us on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, um, it's sort of hard. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. Those yeah, are my, those well, are my stories. I'm sorry. Um, um, but... Again, back, back to those moments when I lose my cool, when I get upset. Mm. Um, I have learned, shaped, that I got better deal with those quickly. Mm. That, that, that I've got, otherwise they eat away and they become much larger than they probably were. Mm. Even if I think they were significant, they probably were. The longer the distance is, the more severe they appear and the harder they are to deal with. Um, that in the moment, it may be rough, but it'll be better in the long run. And I think that that's stuff that Scripture points to. Mm -hmm. um, that those broad patterns we see in Scripture around humility and lowliness are really important pieces in making decisions. Mm. Yeah. I'm thinking sometimes... Scripture, I have a regular, if I can say, pattern of reading scripture. Sometimes you put your time in and it's, you know, just kind of words on a page. It feeds you, but it doesn't stand out. But then there's sometimes when there's like a weight to a phrase. And I mean, it just weighs on my soul, so to speak. Like this is a passage that God is speaking to me, whether it's like how to be a good parent or good student or whatever the case would be. So maybe that's one non-professional ministry way that God chats with me. We've talked about scripture there. How do we, what is the place of scripture in hearing God's call and God's voice? Or how do we just talk? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think scripture is absolutely central. And again, those two kinds of ways that start to out already. It lays a broad base that is God's will for us not necessarily individually, but for all the pattern of life. Mm. Um, 
And so you, John Stott, the great Anglican um, exegete, talked about the Sermon on the Mount as being the Christian constitution. Oh, huh. So the pattern of life, the way the, the way the community is, as we found in those words. Um, I mean, so, so, so that they become the, the bedrock upon which the foundational pieces that we then live our lives upon. Hmm. So that doesn't mean that every piece of the Sermon on the Mount speaks to every moment, but it lays a pattern, a way of being that then addresses context and realities in our lives that may look very different than 2,000 years ago, but the bedrock principles still remain the same. Hmm. So that broad foundational piece, I think the scripture lays down. And then in terms of the comments you made, that sometimes the scripture comes alive and says, ah. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, God has a way of doing that. <laughs> is in the moment, and, and yeah. that happens as well. I mean, I don't know when people are going to be seeing this to steal some of Sunday's thunder. Um, I'm intrigued by the line, the parable of the law of the hidden treasure that that in his joy he sells. That, that the man who's found the field mm. with the treasure in it, in his joy he sells, and that's just a very powerful line around. This giving of everything comes with its powerful joy with it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a piece that's been jumping for me this week. Mm. And certainly, I hope, will show up in what I say um, for the sermon. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I'm thinking, and maybe we can talk about whatever else, but sometimes when I think and discern God's leading in my life, there is an element of risk. Like I am thinking, that's lovely, Lord but probably you've got the wrong person on this call. Do you want to speak to that? What do we do with risk in following Jesus? I think that it's risky, it's dangerous. I mean, every time people talk about risk and following, I'm reminded of, this, of language in the wardrobe. Okay, yeah. In language in the wardrobe, the children are with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, mm -hmm. and it comes out that Aslan, who is a symbol of Christ, is a lion. And Susan asks, is he safe? Mm. And Mr. Beaver, Mr. Beaver says, of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Now, following Jesus is not safe. No, it's, it's not. not safe. It's good, mm -hmm. but it's not safe. So yes, there's risk. Absolutely there's risk. And we are invited to trust that God is inviting us to take risks that he's inviting us to for his good, not it? Yes, it's for our good too. If it's for his good, it's for our good as well. But it's about his good, mm -hmm. his glory, his honor, that we live for his glory and his honor and his good. Um, and yes, sometimes that takes us risky places. Mm. Um, yeah, it's part of life, part of following. It is, yeah. Okay, everyone. We hope this little conversation and chat has been encouraging to you. Just know as the scriptures say, John 10, that his sheep will hear his voice and they will follow his voice. If you are God's sheep, in one of these ways and in many of these ways, God calls you forward in the Christian life. So, God's blessing everyone.